So, so far we've just been assuming that the strings are free, that there's no fields that they live in, and in particular that they live in uh, flat space-time. But of course what we'd be really interested to know is what happens if the strings are living in a curved space-time. And let me sketch so the, the way things should um, go at this point. First, if you think back to the, the end of the first uh, day, we discovered that if strings, depending on, when, depending on how strings are vibrating, which, mo which modes are excited, they can appear as different stringy particles at scales where the strings are indistinguishable from points. And what we saw was amongst the particles that can be understood in the, on this basis are massless spin-2 particles, which look like candidates for gravitons, quanta of a gravitational field. So, I mean, there's a sense in which you can just define a graviton to be a massless spin-2 particle, and then they are gravitons, but what we want, in a more, want something a bit more interesting than that We'd like to see that if these things really are gravitons, they ought to be responsible in some way, um, and I don't mean in a causal way, I mean they ought to somehow be able to constitute space-time curvature. Space-time curvature, what looks like geometry, classically really should just be understood somehow as a state of these graviton excitations. So that's what we're going to see how that works today. But more than that, I mean, that would make them sort of geometrons or something, quanta of geometry. To be gravity, we also need that they, in some sense, satisfy the Einstein field equations. Their classical limit actually is the Einstein field equations, because general relativity is the theory of gravity. So those are the two parts of the um, story today. First, to see the gravit how gravitons account for space-time curvature, and then to see that the Einstein field equation, they must, you know, in the classical limit, satisfy the Einstein field equations, at least to lowest order. You know, that we, we, well, what, what one expects in a theory of quantum gravity is that there will be quantum corrections to the classical theory. So what we want is a lowest order result. And that's what we're going to see today. So, what I'm going to tell you is really the sort of orthodoxy in quantum mechanics. Um, we'll see, there are some, definitely some questions uh, beyond the orthodoxy where we might, where we can discuss what the correct interpretation is. But the story I'm going to um, spell out is the standard orthodox string theory account of um, geometry and gravity in string theory. Okay. Um, I also remember there was one thing that I should have said in the first class, but is worth um, pointing out now. So, we saw um, that in the string action, the relevant parameter was the tension in the way that we wrote it. Um, last time we translated that into a string length. These things are just related to each other um, very simply. And the string length is something like the Planck length. String theorists usually think of it as being a hundred times bigger than the Planck length, or, three, or a thousand times bigger than the Planck length, but something like the Planck length. That means that if that's a length, the relevant mass in the theory then is the Planck mass. So, I mean, and the analysis shows this is right, but what you expect is the gap between the, the vacuum state, the mass gap between the vacuum state and the first excited state is going to be the Planck mass. Okay, that's funny because the vacuum is a tachyon. We saw the first excited state, those are the massless ones. The next citation, next, so those are massless. The second excited state, the mass gap is going to be something again like the Planck mass. Okay? 
So you have massless particles, what you expect, and then we'll find out what the get is, and then the next kind, the first kind of massive particles you have in the theory as we've described it will have mass of something like the Planck mass. Um, does anybody know what the Planck mass is? It's kind of a weird one, because is it really small, is it really big? Well, it's 0.01 milligrams. It's about the mass of a, a flea egg. So that's obviously way, way, way too big to be the mass of an elementary particle. So in fact, the story of how you get, I mean, I'll give you the nice story of the excitations in the bosonic string to get mass particles of different masses. The story of how you get masses of particles that look like something from the standard model it involves the modes, but it's more complicated. Um, and, and there are stories that get you the right kinds of particles. As far as I know, there's no story that gets you exactly the map particles of the standard model. Okay, you need super strings, you need deep brains, there's a whole other kind of structure to actually get some physically plausible string, um, physically plausible particles out of this story. So it's important to kind of emphasize there's something off of what we have not said enough to go beyond the massless particles. But that's okay, because we're interested in gravitons, and those are massless particles, so we don't have to worry about the other things today. Okay. Okay. So, string theory and curved space times. So we have to go back to some quantum mechanics um, basics and then some quantum field theory basics. Um, and I'll tell you what you need to know. So the idea is, well, I'm going to give you enough uh, um, quantum ideas in quantum field theory so you can understand the outline of what's of how these there of how the um, reasoning goes. If you know some quantum field theory or later know some quantum field theory, that's useful to make contact with the kind of thinking that goes on in string theory to show how it um, is of a piece with thinking in quantum field theory um, generally. So um, if you don't, uh, I think it's still useful to see the outline of quantum field theory so you can understand something about how things are thinking. And the starting point is the alternative formulate, but it's fully equivalent formulation of quantum mechanics from Schrodinger or Heisenberg's um, quantum mechanics, which is what people usually um, study first, to Feynman's version of quantum mechanics. Um, in the first lecture, we were looking at classic, the, the classical action and classical um, Lagrangian mechanics. And there, the key thing is Hamilton's principle, which says that the physically allowed classical trajectory is the one that minimizes the action. In quantum mechanics, the principle is Feynman's. And that is, if you want to know a transition amplitude, I give you an initial state and a final state, and want to know the probability, given the action, given the Hamiltonian equivalently, to go from the first state to the second state, this is the prescription that you should follow. Um, for each possible, let me delete the word possible here, for each classical path um, between the initial state and the final state, you associate a value not the a of the action, but e to i times the action. And there's an h bar, e h bar equals 1 in this formula as well. Okay, And add them all up. That will give you the amplitude. So if you want the probability, you have to square the, that sum. Not sum the squares, but square the sum. Okay, so for particles, I want to know the transition amplitude, the tra the transition amplitude between some initial position and some final position. Well, here's one path the thing might take contributes uh, the action for this path. There's another one it might take. These paths are, in some sense, all the paths, not just the one that's classically allowed, because of course there's only one of those. 
not even the ones that are um, continuous. They just have to, um, they're very wild, the ones that you can have. Okay. You can associate, okay, so you sum all those up, and that gives you the amplitude. And it's not too hard to find a quantum mechanics textbook that shows you that that's exactly the same as calculating um, a transition amplitude using a wave function and a Hamiltonian to give you an, a time evolution, a unitary operator to time evolve the theory. Okay, so, um, <coughs> right. Good. For a field, so positions, that looks like that. That's easy to think. So, for a field, Imagine we have sort of space-time at some initial state and some final state, and so this is a spatial slice in the field. Has some configuration of the initial time that I specify. It has, I don't know. So the initial state then is a, a, a field at a particular time across all space, and the final state is another classical field at all time across space. And then you have to, it's going to get kind of messy, if I, you have to think about all the ways the field could sort of evolve between here and here. Every kind of evolution of the field that starts this way and ends this way, because you know, the, the action then uh, is again defined for the, for the fields, because we integrate over space and time. Get a number for each of those. Um, each path contributes e to the i of the action for that path. Um, sum them all up, and that gives you the transition amplitude. For strings, right? Of course, as we've seen, you can think about them um, kind of both ways. If you want to go from the space-time point of view. Imagine a string that looks like that initially, and. I don't know, looks like that at the end, and you want to think about every way the string might wobble through space and time from here to here. Of course, that's the space-time point of view. As I've been emphasizing, the same story has a world sheet point of view as well, where right, I describe how the position of the string by assigning, uh, by just assigning the uh, coordinates of the space-time point to each point of the world sheet here and here. So in fact, I drew this as a two-dimensional in space. From the world sheet point of view, the system is like this one, except the field just lives in one spatial dimension. The world sheet, the string is a one-dimensional object at a time, and the, the x mu Sigma tap sigma, let's call it Ti, describes for each point along at this point at the initial time, let's call it tau. For each point, this function tells me which spatial point it's located at. From the point of view of the string, that's a field configuration living in this one dimensional space that is the string at that time. Okay. So if the string we can look at things from either point of view, either something like there's something moving through space, one dimensional in space, not zero dimensional like a particle, but equivalently, from the point of view of the world sheet, you think of that as a space time, and what we have is this x mu field evolving as a field on the world sheet. Okay? And that's important because this is the picture we actually want. We're going to treat what's happening on the string the way one would a path integral approach to field theory. Um, that's just the way we're going to sort of uh, think about it, but of course it's equivalent to doing it as something moving in space. Okay. 
So, remember, we started with the Nambu Gotu action, um, where the action of the world sheet, uh, for world sheet trajectory, is the space-time area. Okay. So that shows it's not going to be too hard to extend things from flat space-time to um, curved space-time, because the area depends on them. I mean, you're integrating sort of infinitesimal uh, little squares with respect to the metric of the space-time, and so that's something that you know you put a work. It's just as easy to think of the area space-time area of a world sheet in flat space-time as in a curved space-time, and that's the basis of the generalization. We there is voice now. Um, we will, in fact, not approach things with the number go to action, but the Polyakov action. So, <coughs> we want to generalize things. Uh, I think in the, I may have written the Polyakov action before with terms. like this. There's a derivative of this x mu field with respect to um, tau, and a derivative with respect to um, this uh, world sheet field with respect to sigma, and I take the squares of each of them. But this square is with respect to this space-time index. So as I said, when I take a square like this, I'm taking the square with respect to the metric of the space-time. So that's easy to change from uh, I mean, sort of taking a Minkowski square dot product, which is what I've done in these. I have the same thing here. If G were mu nu were the Minkowski metric, this term here is exactly the same as what I've just written over there. Okay, that's, what, that's what it is to take the square. Um, here I've put in explicitly the metric, so you can see that I'm taking the dot product with respect to the, the space-time metric. Okay, so G mu nu could be flat, in which case we just have the same thing. Um, but, I mean, actually the squared is always going to imply that there's a metric in there. But I've written the metric out explicitly here. So this is the same Polyakov action that we started with before, except I've now given myself the flexibility to put in um, a general curved uh, Lorentzian metric. And I'm just going to, by definition, split that G up into a part, this is the Minkowski metric, plus whatever the extra bit is that is required. <coughs> to get me to G mu nu, just simply rewritten things. Okay, so this is the familiar um, Polyakov action um, generalized. You can see what's going to happen when we go to the path integral picture. What you'll see in a minute is then the amplitude of any path. Is e, is e to the i s, and that's now going to look like something that's e to the i um, an integral with the e to mu nu of something um, times e to the integral of something that has the h mu nu of something in it. This sum for path integral amplitude, this sum is e to the i of this thing, so that's the same as multiplying the two exponentials together. Okay, so that's our action, and we'll write this up, um, this is the path amplitude, we'll write this up again in a, in a minute, but for now, I'm going to say a few things about quantum field theory um, 
in general. Uh, just to give a flavor of what is, is going to go on. So this is quantum field theory two. Quantum field theory one was when we took the Fourier transform of a classical field, saw that it amounted to a collection of harmonic oscillators, individually quantized each of those, and found that the field then is, you know, that they have discrete excitations corresponding to discrete numbers of quanta. That's sort of the particle picture of what's going on. The other picture of quantum field theory, of the same theory, um, develops the idea of a path integral. So Feynman's principle tells you to, that to calculate a transition amplitude, you have to calculate the, you know, how to calculate the amplitudes of individual paths. But calculating a path integral is a complicated and difficult thing to do in general. And Feynman also gave us, and this is part of the practical value of, of his um, principle, is that the part, these path integrals that you want to know because of the principle can be computed using general, almost algorithmic, um, perturbative <coughs> techniques. And these are Feynman diagrams. Uh, hey, Jimmy, is just a, a slightly curved space-time, or is any space-time you want? So, any space-time. OK, that's, yeah, yeah. It's not a perturbation. Sorry? It's not a perturbation. So we'll, we, can, we will talk about that, but I have not assumed that here. I'm going to put in anything that I like here. Um, yeah, we had a discussion about this. <laughs> it's an important point, but for now I'm not thinking that it's, it's small. This is not... Right. Let's come back. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, but we're not just going to get linearized gravity out. We're going to get full GR out. Yes. Okay. The path integral. Okay, so this method for calculating path integrals tells you to uh, gives you instructions for drawing um, Feynman diagrams and summing as many of those up as you can draw to get as accurate as possible um, a, 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 a computation approximation to the path integral. Obviously, don't have time to talk about the full um, framework. Most likely people in this room have seen these things before. It's a method which tells you to draw, a series, to draw diagrams, and for each diagram contributes a certain um, numerical quantity to the amplitude. In any, you basically draw any, you know, subject to other constraints, any topologically possible drawing. And the rules effectively say, for every line in your drawing, you're going to get a momentum integral as it were, summing over all kind of ways a particle might, all momenta a particle might have when it goes from one point to another. For each node, you're going to associate um, the interaction strength, sort of the charge of the electron or something like that. And that gives you a recipe for associating a number with each of these diagrams. But if the coupling, the interaction strength is weak, then the more complicated the diagrams, diagram is, the more nodes it has, the more factors of the coupling are going to appear, and the smaller the value that diagram is going to have. Okay. So I've got a diagram here that only has two nodes, and so this is proportional to, the, the value of this diagram is proportional to lambda squared. This one has four nodes, and it's going to, so its value is going to be proportional to lambda to the fourth. So if lambda's small, this one's going to make a bigger contribution than this one does. Okay? And then lambda to the sixth, is, they just get smaller and smaller. And so the trick is, if I can calculate, you know, so uh, calculate, well, this is really no interact, right? So it's sort of the lowest order term. If I want to make a correction to it, I'll cal you calculate these terms. If you want to make a finer correction to it to get a better approximation, you compute the, it is the lambda to, to the sixth terms and the lambda to eighth, but each time it's smaller and smaller. So you stop doing it at the point where the value of being more accurate gets less than the cost of doing the computation. And then you're sort of done. Okay.
I mean, that's assuming that these sums <coughs> converge, which they generally don't, so at some point you just have to swap finitely anyway, but that's the basic picture. I think, I mean, it's not super important for our string theory purposes, but I do want to emphasize, okay, these pictures are not the classical part, the classical paths over which we are summing here. <coughs> okay. This is a path, and these are, um, Feynman diagrams for a field process, but these are not the classical paths that we're supposed to sum according to Feynman's principle. Okay? Those are paths of classical field to classical field evolutions. What these are is a technique for calculating the sum of these things, the actual path integrals. I think sometimes people call these path integrals, but they're not the ones that are talked about up here. These are just a scheme for calculating that sum. Okay. So, I just wanted to mention this to, as I said, to sort of tie in um, the, the nature of the results that I'm going to present to standard methods in quantum field theory. And also, more generally, the results that um, I'm going to quote from are results from perturbation theory. So when you, the derivation of general relativity is something that you find at lowest order in perturbation theory. And so I wanted to make sure we understood what that means. So at the lowest order in the coupling that we'll see in string theory, we get general relativity. If one takes other terms, one finds quantum corrections. So this picture is going to apply to the string. These lines are going to correspond, okay. In ordinary quantum field theory, these are sort of something like particle processes in three plus one dimensions. In the string, it's, we're talking about excitations, in the world sheet. As I said, we're thinking about the evolution of the X mu field from one state at a time to we're raised at a different state of the X mu field at a later time. From the string being one way now to being some other way later. So we are talking fields. So what are these lines then representing? Well, in field theory in general, they represent the motion of free particles, of those simple harmonic um, oscillator excitations, those plane wave <coughs> particles. Same thing in string theory. Those modes we saw excited, that's what these lines are. So these are the techniques in the string, and they're for calculating processes for that field living on the string, which is, from the, a space-time point of view, the evolution of the string in space-time. Okay. So when have, if you had diagrams like this, they don't represent strings, they represent kind of waves propagating on the string in the same in the quantum way. Okay, so okay, so that's what I just said. Um, so Feynman diagrams for modes propagating on the string. That is uh, applying perturbative methods to calculating the path integral from the, for the string to go from one string state to a later string state. The field theory picture just carries over onto the, onto the string with the reminder that this X mu field that lives on the string really amounts to a prescription for how the string is embedded in space-time. So it also amounts to an evolution for the string. Um, right. That tells you what the lines are in, this, in string theory, in the perturbative approach to string theory. What would the coupling, the relevant coupling be? It's the other question in perturbative methods for the string. Well, I'm just going to speak very sort of heuristically here. Um, though if you look at uh, Green, Schwartz, and Witten, it's about the same as what they say there for why this is the right expansion. I think if you look in more detail, you can see it's the right way. Look, the coupling, this is, is going to have to have something to do with um, 
the, the curvature of space-time that the string finds itself in. Um, and how would one go about parameterizing that? So something like the stronger the inter... Sorry, so why is that? Well, you see that the action has this term of, of the, with the metric in here. So somehow, this, is some, this looks like the term that's telling you how the fields couple, what the interaction strength is. So somehow, the intuition is, I mean, just to speak heuristically, how strong the interaction is depends on the metric, and it's going to depend on how curved the space-time is. The more curved the space-time is, the more strong the interactions are going to be. Um, I think that's the sort of heuristic idea that's about as much as I want to say here. How can we parameterize the curvature? Well, a convenient way is to think about the radius of curvature. I mean, this is a sort of natural idea in the, just in two dimensions, a sort of Gaussian idea. If you have a um, curved surface, you want to think what's the smallest, and you, at a point, it's curved, you're interested in sort of the smallest circle that would have the same curvature at that point, and then the radius of that. So the bigger the radius of curvature, the smaller um, the circle is, the less curved the space-time is. That's the very easy sort of intuitive idea. Um, we want actually a dimensionless constant. So, right, the bigger the radius of curvature, the less the space is curved. So the coupling strength goes like one over the radius of curvature, because that's then it going, the greater the curvature, the stronger the coupling is. And to make it dimensionless, um, well, we have a nice constant with the dimensions of length in the theory, namely the string length. So the natural uh, coupling strength, and so the term in which the perturbative expansion is going to be taken, is going to take place, is the string length divided by the radius of curvature. Just think about drawing a, as I say, a circle at any point of space. The more the space is curved like this, it's a really big circle you can put there. The space is curved like this, it's a smaller circle that you can put there. So this is going to be the expansion um, parameter, something like the coupling. For historical reasons, the expansion is actually expressed in this constant alpha prime, which is equal to L squared, the, the string length squared over 2. Um, I think I mentioned this to one or two people. This is the, the Reggie slope. It goes back to 1960s method, uh, quantum field, high energy physics. Um, and that's, that's the parameter they like to express it in. But it appears here because, as I said, we're interested in um, expansion with respect to the radius of curvature, which means we have to have some fundamental length to make sense of this. And that's really what alpha prime is here. So what this is saying is this, the approximation, and this is going to the question, it's going to be, come back to the question you two were asking before. The results are going to be um, given in terms of an expansion in terms of alpha prime, and that means that they are more accurate, that, you know, that they, these are accurate when the radius of curvature is much bigger than the Planck plane. But the Planck length is really small, so that means you can have a lot of curvature by classical standards. In fact, basically the theory is, the, the Planck length is the kind of scale that you expect quantum effects to appear in gravity, and that's what's being said here. Okay. It's effectively the, length, the string length that's relevant to the, to the exact, to the, the first order, to the perturbation expansion, and as long as the radius of curvature is large compared to the string scale, which is around the Planck scale, the result, the, the low order terms are going to be accurate. And that's much, much, much more curvature than you get from linear gravity. It's totally different. Okay, good. Uh, I made a parenthetical remark here. We ignore string-string interactions. <coughs> I'm only telling you 
half of the story, or in some sense, the square root, sort of the square root of two of the story, or something like that. The square root of the story, that's the half, perhaps not really half the story, it's the half power of the story. Because we've just, the only, if we're talking about, you know, we've just, I just talked about perturbation theory when the string does this, or this, starts closed and ends closed, starts open and ends open. And, but we talked from our talk yesterday, we know strings can do more than that. For instance, in a full theory of strings, and we'll return to this point in the second half, I could have a string that, as it were, an open string that's split in two. So now I have two strings, time's going up the, up the board. At this point in time, I have two strings, this one and this one. Maybe they join together again. Maybe they split again. <coughs> this is something that can happen. Um, same with the sort of closed string. It's harder to draw it. I've got my closed string. It can close off here into two closed strings. So I've got this here and this here. This really is supposed to be a hole right through it. Now it's a one closed string for splits into two closed strings, and then the, okay. those are we. I mean, we need that's supposed to be happening because we think and we saw that in the um, yesterday when we were seeing strings that were wound around um, a cylindrical dimension. So one one that's double wound could be split into two singly wound ones, and, and vice versa. That's why the winding number can change in um, quantum string theory. So proper string theory requires you, these now look like, like stringy Feynman diagrams. Instead of lines, I have two-dimensional surfaces that are splitting and joining, as in the Feynman diagram. And to compute proper, complete string um, amplitudes, you need to use these as well. We're just going to look at, we're, we're, we're just going to put that to one side. Basically the same story goes through in each of these cases. Uh, these are more kind of complicated topologies for these space times for, to compute what's actually going on in these, in, in these cases. Um, well, maybe I'll just flag this point now and try to remember to come back to this. That's sort of interesting from what I've said. You know, these aren't classical transitions, just as um, these pictures aren't classical paths to which we're assigning um, transition amplitudes. And neither are these. So what I've drawn here, just as these are, you know, refer to terms in a perturbative expansion for calculating the actual path integrals, so are these for the string point of view. The difference is in the quantum field theory, I can write, you can write the classical action down and so you know what, the, what it is you're really trying to calculate using this perturbative expansion. In string theory, it's just defined this way and you don't know what the action is that you're approximating. I'll come back to that point. But in this sense, because, um, yeah, I mean, in that sense, but this is all you know about calculating string amplitudes. You don't really know what string theory is at a fundamental level. Okay, and I think we'll say some things to make more sense of that sort of later. Okay, yeah. So I should say, these have sort of interaction vertices, um, and there is a there's a sort of vertex there and there and there and there, and there's going to have to be some string interaction strength that gets associated with each, each vertex. One of the reasons string theory is good is that I don't have points where I put the vertex, where I put the, the interactions don't happen as a, a, a points as they do in quantum field theory. They kind of happen over a whole region. There's no point where it splits, it just pulls apart. That's one of the reasons string theory is sort of better defined than quantum field theory. Um, and I end up 
digressing too much. But it's, it, I mean, it's worth mentioning because you might have heard this. So it appears that there have to be two constants in string theory. There's this string length, which is just directly related to this, really the same as this alpha prime, and I, again, didn't show, is directly related to the tension. So there's that constant just in different forms. It looks like there's a different, a second constant that string theory has to have to say how, uh, to, to indicate the strength of the couplings. But it's not, in fact, it's not the case. This strength is determined dynamically by the theory. This is not a free parameter in the theory, which is also a pretty remarkable property. Okay, good. We won't consider diagrams directly like that, but we will do something almost as, almost as good, close to that. So we're not going to think about strings, we're not going to, take it, we're not going to pay attention to strings um, splitting and, and joining, but there is, I'm just going to present it to you, I'm afraid this is one of the things I'm just going to give to you as a sort of matter of fact. One can ask the question, how would the path integral be different if I've drawn it sort of classically, if along the way um, it interacted with some other particles, stringy particles, so other strings along the way, how would that affect um, the path integral? So that's what I've drawn in my uh, picture here. This is um, one of the possible paths between, it's supposed to be one of the possible paths between an initial string state and a final string state. So I'm back to Feynman's principle. As you, uh, I should say that. We're going to put the, I mean, I'm just going to quote the perturbative <coughs> results. Um, we've looked at the perturbation theory so you can understand what they mean. But now we're going to go back to Feynman principle and just proper path integrals and not worry about the perturbative story. So I'm doing my path integral, and here's one of the possible, here's my initial state, here's my final state, and you know, here's one of the possible classical paths. And um, okay, if, nothing, if it, nothing happened to it along the way, um, the, inter, the, the amplitude that this path contributes would be e to the i s, as usual, as Feynman says, where s is the action for this one. But, Suppose along the way it actually interacted with some incoming particle of type psi and some incoming particle of type phi. A question you might ask is how what would the different what that contribution what would the contribution to the amplitude be in that case? And there's just a recipe for figuring that out. For each type of particle, one can just define a particular fun associated function, either psi or phi. And that function just multiplies the action, um, the sort of exponentiated action, and that's the contribution. So it's just a general recipe for calculating um, the amplitudes in this scenario. And it happens, I mean, this is sort of, na kind of pretty natural looking. Suppose the phi particle is just a scalar particle or a string in one of those scalar states. And the string, it interacts I guess at, at point y, then the, the correct function to act to um, multiply the amplitude by is e to the ikx. For the graviton, <coughs> it's this more complicated thing. Um, but again, it's kind of natural. So it's, it's a free particle, so I get this e to the ikx. The graviton has is a spin two particle. It has those two indices, so like mu nu. And so it's not surprising there's a mu nu. But I have to have something that's just a, you know, a scalar function here. And it turns out, again, I'm not going to justify this, that the uh, correct form of the rest of the expression is this um, x dot squared um, plus x prime squared looking, looking kind of thing. And of course, this expression is now starting to look kind of familiar. 
So let's see. Okay. So okay, good. I'm going to justify this statement above. What we're going to see for the rest of this slide and the rest of uh, this this lecture is how we now can see what's going on, what that H mu u was, is, when we think of the string in a curved background. So this is again now um, for a particular classical path. The Feynman amplitude that that path contributes, right, is e to the i s. So I'm just going back to what I said at, at, at the beginning. Then if we put if we have the Polyakov action with G mu nu instead of the uh, general G mu nu instead of the Minkowski metric, that's the same as inserting, as, as replacing mu nu with mu nu plus H mu nu, but that's just to say that the path integral um, in a curved background, the Polyakov, sorry, the <coughs> amplitude for a path, path um, in a, a string path in a curved background should be this expression, which is just the same expression we had before um, with mu nu nu. Okay, but there I, I wrote it in terms of mu nu. Eta mu nu plus h mu nu. I've just turned that plus in, the plus that's inside the ex exponent into a product of exponentials. Okay. And we look at this, and then we see well, look, this is quite like having the flat space-time Polyakov action times the graviton. Because, well, in particular, I see this x dot mu, x dot mu, blah, 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 term appearing over here. But this expression here is not what I would get, of course, just by taking... Um, the flat space-time Polyakov action, and just and just inserting a single the, the operator for a single graviton, that would involve having this times simply this expression. That's what we do when there's uh, the, the field in, the, the string interacts with a gra a single graviton. Um, we would just take the first term and multiply it by this term. That's the that's the prescription that we would be following up from up here. But that's not quite what we have. We have this exponentiated term that's clearly similar to, has something to do with gravitons. So let's see what, we're going to focus on this term and use this idea that path integrals pick up um, a factor like this. I should say path amplitudes pick up a factor like this for each graviton that they meet along the way. Okay. That's the way to think about it. If a string propagates in Minkowski space-time, the amplitude um, <coughs> but meets uh, gravitons along the way, the amplitude we want is this for Minkowski space-time plus something involving these, one for each graviton that it meets along the way. So let's break this down and see what it's telling us about the gravitons that were meant along the way. Okay, and then it's all pretty fairly straightforward. So I'm getting bored of writing this everything out in these parentheses. So these dots here are just is just instead of this. Okay, um, and if you're writing things down, you're probably grateful of that as well. Okay, so I'm looking at the second term, I'm just, and I, I guess I'm bored of writing these d tau, d sigmas as well, so I'm not going to bother with those. Um, but this sec, so this second term, I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to abbreviate to this, but I just mean the second, the second factor by this expression. The integral involves the d tau, d sigma, I didn't propose it. Okay, so I'm just simply going to Fourier, we're, let's work in a box to keep things simple. We could use an integral and it would be more complicated, but we'll just do it this way. We'll just so imagine we're in a box. So I'm just going to expand h mu nu. Um, I'm going to get in a, a Fourier expansion. Okay, I'm just going to sum over modes k of this h mu nu. That's all I've done here. 
and then I'm going to pull this um, sum of terms out in, that's in the exponent <coughs> and make it into a product of um, exponentials. Okay. This sum just pulls it out as a, as a product, and so the expression just become, becomes this. Okay. So it's just bridge, free expand and perform a trivial manipulation. All right. Now we look at what's inside um, the integral here. This a u nu, with a k on it, e to the i k x, and then dot dot dot. And what we see is that is, of course, exactly what we get for one graviton. So each one of these a u nu, e i k x, parentheses, blah 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 corresponds, we said to one, the meet, this sheet meeting, this world sheet meeting one graviton along the way. Okay? So, I'm not, this isn't an equals, what I'm interested in is, given that this is the path integral, what must the background state of gravitons have been that it interacted with along the way? Okay? And I can answer that question again because I have the ex this expression here, every time it appears, tells me it meant one graviton along the way. Okay? So, what does a one graviton state look like? Um, <coughs> so, each one of these corresponds to a state of Remember, M is our excitation number, so I get a single um, <coughs> excitation of the kth, at the kth level. Um, and if I write that out in terms of um, operators, of, uh, creation and annihilation operators, I want the creation operator for the kth mode acting on the vacuum. And so, again, yeah, it's kind of heuristic, where I see um, this expression here, I'm going to replace it. Each one of these is one, um, uh, one excited state. So I'm going to replace this with um, a creation, the appropriate creation operator. And I realize there should be a k down here. There should be a k on here. Okay. So this is sort of the first crucial step. Recap, um, adding this part to uh, the, this, uh, this, uh, this tensor to the uh, Minkowski metric to produce a curved background space-time. Just Fourier expand it, um, and I see what I have is some product of, uh, an exponential, some product of exponentiated uh, graviton operators. That tells me then that the state that it, that it interacted with, the string interacted with during this uh, transition for this diagram must look like this. And simply by replacing each one of the, every time I see a, um, an, a graviton operator, that's got to correspond to one excitation. Okay. I want to just think about the meaning of this quantum state. So now, just by looking at this, we figured out what the background <coughs> quantum state was. Some state, this particular state of gravitons. What is that? There's another way of looking at what that state must be like, um, which comes from looking at, this is where we will talk about coherent states. Um, we can talk about coherent states of harmonic oscillators. And a harmonic oscillator is defined to be um, a state which, which can be defined to be a state which is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. Co what we think of a coherent state as an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. The annihilation operator is not permission, so it, it's not going to be a real. It's not going to have real eigenvalues. Okay, but it's an eigen. It's a, there are reasons, particularly in quantum optics, why this is an interesting state to think about, kind of state to think about. But just take it. A coherent state is a, an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. And 
you can in fact sort of check, given what we said earlier about raising and lowering operators and their algebra and the facts that I gave you, that if I take a state that is e to the alpha is some, some constant, some number you put in, um, a dagger operator acting on the vacuum, well, you can expand this out in a power series for the exponential, and you have a whole load of commutations to do here to swap the, to, to, to um, commute the um, annihilation and creation operators that you get. But what you'll find out, find it is that is indeed this kind of state is an eigenstate of the uh, annihilation operator, and in fact, the eigenvalue would be this alpha that you put into the exponent. And so it makes it sense, in fact, like label this state as with the alpha. That state that I've written there, you would just call naturally call it an alpha, the alpha um, coherent state. And so then the upshot is, if this state is, since this state is an eigenstate of the uh, annihilation operator, it this should be an alpha in here. Uh, sorry, this should have a sorry should have a hat on it. Of course, the expectation value of A in such a state just is alpha. Okay. That's for a single simple harmonic. So that tells you that, as it were, the classical amplitude for the simple harmonic oscillator is alpha. When I go to the field, I have now a sort of product. I've got something that gives me, now we look at this, we see that's the form that we have. Again, there should be a K here. This is creating coherent state for each of the modes of the field, for each value of the field. This is a sort of product of these. So for every, every, in this system, every mode of the field um, is now in a coherent state. For every mode of the field, by this analysis, you can see the amplitude is going to be um, this A mu nu, whatever I put in here. But Quantum modes, right, the quantum modes classically correspond to plane waves. That's how we got the modes of um, what we've already transformed to start with. And so it's going to follow that this quantum state classically looks like a state um, where each, if, you know, classically, we add up the modes. Each mode, uh, each mode K has, for this reason, the amplitude alpha mu nu. The constant I put in here is the amplitude for each is for the state. So the cla this quantum state corresponds to a classical state where each mode gets this to be its each classical mode has this as its amplitude. But of course, going back to the uh, beginning, what I did up here. Uh, not what I did down here, h mu mu, we just defined, to, that's where these a mu, this alpha mu mu terms came from. They just are the Fourier coefficients for expanding h mu mu. And so, what we've seen is, okay, we've, we've added h mu mu into the, into the polytop action. That changes the um, path amplitude to take this form when we expand it. We've seen from the operator um, insertion uh, story, that corresponds to a quantum state like this. The analysis of coherent states tells us this quantum state um, corresponds to a classical, has a, is, is the classical, is the state that sort of has a classical description like this. I mean, it's quantum, but the most classical description you can have is this which is then to contribute this tensor to the, to the state. Okay. I mean, in a way, it looks like we put h mu nu here and ended up with h mu nu nu here. So what if the whole story is is a consistency story in which we understand now that this h mu nu is really the classical limit of something of a quantum state of uh, appropriate quantum state of gravitons. So just inserting this h mu nu into the action through this story is exactly what you would um, do, is exactly the right thing to do if you think that there is you know, a classical state that h mu nu, the, a classical contribution to the 
um, geometry of H mu nu, that is, in fact, composed of gravitons. It's really what you're doing is you're saying, not that there's a class, if you want to, this H mu nu really represents the presence of a quantum field state like this. It represents exact, adding this H mu nu is exactly what you should do if you wanted to ask what happens to the string if there is this particular state, quantum field state, of gravitons in the, as a background. Okay, so that tells you that the way to interpret this classical contribution is as, in fact, um, a quantum field state of gravitons. There is a coherent state of gravitons, and this H mu nu is a representing their effect, not an actual classical background. You write in a classical background, that's what we did, but that is to represent the effect of a coherent state of gravitons, of a quantum gravitational contribution, of geometrical, contrib um, quantum geometrical field. Okay. So, the upshot of that is, you take the Polyakov action, instead of eta mu nu, you write in g mu nu. What you are really doing when you do that is changing the action not to that of a string now in a classical curved background. What, from the string theory point of view, what you are doing is writing down the action for a string that is moving in a background of, gra of gravitons, of a coherent state of gravitons, a quantum field state. Looks like you're putting it in a classical geometry, but in fact you're putting it in a background of a quantum field state, a coherent state of gravitons. Those are the same, those are what you would do to make the same changes to the action in either case. From the string point of view, they should be gravitons and not a curved um, classical background. Um, of course, um, the other step is. Well, there's more things to say about that. But we also have now come back to remember what a graviton is according to string theory. These aren't an independent field in which the... So we've, we've seen that we're now talking of... When you think you're talking about a string in a curved background, you're really talking about a string in a, a co with a coherent state of gravitons as the background. But the big sort of important point at that point is... Those gravitons aren't an independent field in which the string is living. The gravitons themselves are just strings in a particular state. So we got now, right, so the string, you think it's moving in a curved background, curved classical background, it's really moving in a, a coherence, in a background that's a coherent state of gravitons, but that coherent state of gravitons is itself really some state of strings, each of which is in the, the mode of a graviton, and a graviton mode. So the whole story does not come out of string theory at all. I don't have to put anything, so we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, but let's say, I don't have to put anything into this story other than strings to understand the action that I have, and so the physics that I have when strings propagate in curved backgrounds. 